thank you all for coming today to the commemoration for Lawrence Wilfrid Mansfield. Um, he was born in Burheath on the 12th of November 1888, and his family had come down from Cambridgeshire to uh, work at the jam factory that used to be at North Tadworth Farm. It had only opened the previous year. Uh, the, the tenant farmer there, Mr. Hodson, um, had grown corn, but he decided to change business into something more profitable when he worked out an arrangement with his landlord at the time, Lord Edgemont. Uh, and he agreed uh, that he would be allowed to plant fruit trees on what became later the site of De Burr School. Um, and uh, he uh, negotiated an arrangement with Lord Edgemont where he could put down vermin on the estate so that he could stop the rabbits destroying his crops. It was a, a very valuable uh, business to the local community. It employed many people. Um, it distributed something like £5,000 worth of wages every year, a large amount of money in those days. And there was a lot of seasonal workers came to, to Burheath to work there. But a lot of locals, like the Mansfields, were employed there um, as well. They produced something like 1,000 tonnes of, of preserves and marmalades um, for sale each year. They had a, a dedicated siding at Tadworth Station. They were doing that much business. Uh, before that, the carts used to have to uh, take the produce down to, for sale in London um, overnight. And we commemorated uh, Charlie Grayson um, last year, and his father had used to uh, drive the carts um, down into London. He presumably had lost his job when the railway came to Tadworth. Uh, and uh, that sort of set off a long chain of events which ended up with the Graysons moving to Australia. And that's where uh, Charlie's uh, story led him. But the Mansfields, as I say, arrived as the, uh, the jam factory was going into business. They may have been specifically brought down uh, to work um, in the factory by my, Mr. Hodson. He, did import, he was known to have brought in several people to get the business going. Um, Alfred Mansfield, uh, Lawrence's father, was a jam boiler. Uh, quite a skilled job. The factory employed uh, several of them. They also had many, uh, many laborers working within the factory, moving crates of uh, preserves around, and also lots of people out in the fields as well. And one of Lawrence's older brothers was working as a laborer um, at the factory as well. Um, Lawrence went to school on the green in the Wesleyan School, um, which used to stand there until about the 1950s, I think. And um, the school was actually paid for by Mr. Hodson. Um, of the farm. Uh, Burheath is quite interesting because there's a, uh, there was a, a big Methodist movement in that area at the time. Uh, Mr. Hodson um, of North Tadworth Farm and Mr. Templeton of Cannons Farm were two of the leading lights um, of that uh, particular movement. Uh, and they had their own chapel on the green and the school as well that about half the, the village's children attended. Lawrence was uh, one of the older students when the school um, reopened following some building works in 1901. Um, he was the second on the, on the admissions register after the headmaster's son. And he did very well at school, actually. He stayed on, as most children did, to the age of 14. Uh, but he reached uh, standard seven, which was more than most children uh, did in those days. Uh, by that stage, he would have been quite advanced in, uh, and been uh, doing a lot of self-studying. Um, he would have perhaps have taught the younger children in the school um, as well, under supervision from the master. Now, he left school uh, in 1901, uh, sorry, 1903, and he might have gone to work um, at the jam factory following in his father's footsteps, but the business was in trouble. Uh, the landlord had changed. Lord Edgemont had sold off the estate to, to the Coleman family. Uh, the first Frederick Coleman um, had continued the arrangement with Mr. Hodson uh, quite amicably. Uh, the second Frederick Coleman, who inherited the estate from his father, uh, was not the same. He was a, a hunting man. And he wanted to increase the amount of game on the estate, which meant that he allowed rabbits uh, to breed um, unchecked. And he wouldn't allow Mr. Hodson in to, uh, to, to put the vermin down. And so they destroyed his crops. And he had suffered several bad years. Uh, and it ended up uh, as a legal fight uh, between Mr. Hodson uh, and Frederick Coleman. Unfortunately, Frederick Coleman uh, won in the end. The bailiffs were sent to evict uh, Mr. Hodson from his farm. Uh, and the business was closed down. So Alfred became a gardener, uh, and when Lawrence left school, he too became gardener, working with his father uh, at one of the big houses um, that surrounded the village of Burheath. He was quite quick on his feet, uh, Lawrence. He, uh, in 1902, there was a sports day um, to celebrate the uh, coronation of King Edward VII at Burheath. Uh, they had various different sporting events, uh, including a, a greasy pole, uh, people would climb to, to, to win a, a leg of lamb at the top. Lots of races for the children and also for adults as well. Steeple chases, apparently the water jump created much 
interest with so many people falling in it uh, on the way. Um, and the Kensington and Chelsea School Band, the, the, what became Beach Home down by, uh, down by Nork, um, sent their band up there to play through the afternoon, provide a selection of music, and uh, everyone danced away into the evening and then enjoyed the contents of two barrels of beer which had been bought uh, for the occasion. He won, so Lawrence uh, won two races, um, two 80-yard dash races um, at that particular meeting. He was just on the border between two age groups at the time, and so he was able to win the younger age category, and he came third in the older age category. He also had a, a younger sister, Olive. He, he had five older brothers, uh, and he had a younger sister, Olive. And she, too, was just on the boundary of age groups and won one of her races and came second um, in the other. Apart from that happy, uh, that happy day, the, the early 1900s were not a good time uh, for the family, with the jam factory uh, closing down. Uh, and then uh, Lawrence lost his mother, uh, lost two of his brothers. Uh, and so by the time the 1911 census had been taken, um, he was living with his baby sister, uh, Olive, and his father uh, still at the house on the green. Now, they lived at number four, uh, Green's Cottages, which is the right hand um, of a semi-detached pair of cottages. And I'm always surprised whenever I go to, to Burheath, because I always drive past it and I see the modern houses and I kind of forget that they're all the older houses, they're still there. Uh, and I was very surprised and very happy to see that Four Greens Cottages is still there. Although the rest of Greens Cottages from number six to 10 um, have gone a long time ago. Number four and number five still stand today. Uh, and he lived in, in the house, as I say, with his, with his widowed father. And he was still living there. Uh, when the war came. Uh, he signed up quite early um, in the war. Uh, he joined the Territorial um, Army and he uh, chose to join the East Surrey Regiment. Um, he joined about a week um, after uh, George Nash, who we commemorated a few weeks ago, joined the 2nd 5th uh, Battalion of the East Surrey Regiment. So in the peacetime structure of the army, they'd have a couple of regular uh, battalions and they'd have a couple of reserve battalions and they'd have a couple of Territorial Battalions and the 5th one of their territorial battalions. At the start of the war, uh, the men that had signed on for um, overseas service uh, became the first fifth East Surreys and they were dispatched overseas. And the men that had signed on for home service only stayed behind and became the second fifth. And it was this uh, battalion that Lawrence joined. But crucially, he chose to opt for service overseas, as many of the men did, as, such as George Nash. Despite the fact they'd signed on for foreign service, they actually ended up on the home front for a very long time, waiting until they'd build up enough men that the whole battalion could be moved, uh, could be moved um, overseas. And they were based near here. They were based near Rygate um, initially, and they were working on the defence line um, over the North Downs. Um, when there'd been an invasion scare, um, when we thought the French were going to invade just before the beginning of the 20th century, we built a, a, a chain of mobilisation centres, of which Rygate Fort is the nearest one uh, to us. Um, where tools and ammunition could be stored. Uh, and a plan was drawn up that um, a, a force of thousands of labourers would be able to, and volunteer soldiers would be able to dig a line of defences all along the North Downs, stretching from Guildford almost to the coast, within just a few days. Um, those plans were slightly altered when war broke out, and that line didn't get, much, well, didn't get all the way to Dorking in the end, um, but it was extended and round to, to the Palmerston forts um, on the Kent coast. And it was on that um, particular line that Lawrence um, and the 5th East Surreys worked. So they dug here at Rygate and then over at Rotham um, in Kent. And when they'd finished their work, um, they then went on coastal defence duties on the east coast, on the Isle of Thanet, at the, Thames, the mouth of the Thames estuary. And they were there for several months, um, into the summer of 1916. In the meantime, of course, all the regular battalions of the East Surreys had been fighting. Uh, most of them had been on the Western Front. The first battalion of the East Surreys um, we've met before, uh, John Henry Wade and Arthur Bouvier, we've commemorated already, who served with them, and we've talked about uh, their hard times at Ypres in 1915, and then the, uh, the long summer and peaceful Picardy um, of 1915 and through the winter of 1516. And then they stayed on Picardy for those early months of 16 uh, and ended up fighting on the Somme. They had hard fighting uh, at Longueval uh, and Delville Wood in July, during which um, Arthur Bubia was uh, mortally wounded. Uh, and then they fought later on um, at the Battle of Morval uh, and the Battle of Ginshi. They'd suffered dreadful casualties, and so they needed reinforcements. And they were getting them from wherever they could find them. Um, 
And at about the autumn of 16, drafts of men started to go from the 2nd, 5th um, East Surrey Regiment. And towards the end of November, uh, Lawrence was sent out to France. He arrived, joined the 1st East Surreys after a few days at a, a base um, at Etapel. Uh, and he joined them on the 7th of December, the day the capital of Romania uh, fell. News which the Germans wrote, painted on signs to show the British uh, troops uh, proud of their victory uh, there. And he joined the East Surreys in the trenches just a few days, a few days after that. He came in, it was quite a quiet sector they were in, in northern France, they, they were resting from their time on the Somme, uh, and they were up by Bethune, um, on, just on the north side of the La Basse Canal. Now, the ground was frozen, it was very difficult to dig. Uh, when it was thawed, it was waterlogged because it was so low down. And so the trenches were only a couple of feet deep. Uh, and they built up these great big breastworks of, of sandbags um, reinforced by wooden frames at the front and the rear of each trench. The front line was, uh, was really a series of posts. Um, so uh, a garrison of 10 or a dozen men would hold a strong point, and then there'd be a section of empty trenches that can be manned in an emergency, protected by lengths of barbed wire. And so they had 10 of these strong points that they maintained in the front line, uh, and then a series of uh, a continuous line behind them in support. And they had quite a sophisticated defensive strategy um, by that time. And so they were, the system was designed to allow the Germans in behind. But once they were in, it was almost like a trap because they could be shot at uh, from the flanks by, um, by the men in these strong points. Uh, and then the men in the support line had a clear field of fire. And in between the two of them were thick bands of wire that would slow the Germans down and hang them up there and make them easy targets uh, for the Surreys. There weren't. Many, many attacks taking place at that time. It was winter, nothing very much uh, happened for either side. Um, but what was going on was underground warfare, and both sides were detonating mines under each other's front line uh, in order to, to build uh, better or gain better position for themselves, build new strong points, so that when those attacks did start coming in the spring, then they would be in a better position. And there are several of those attacks, um, there are several of those um, incidents going on, which these Surreys took part in. As soon as a mine blew, they'd have to rush out, uh, garrison the crater, and start building these new, these new strong points. After uh, three months or so down uh, up at Bethune, um, the East Surreys were withdrawn to uh, take part in a training uh, program. New offences have been, uh, offensives have been planned uh, for the spring. Um, a joint Anglo-French attack was going to take place. Uh, the Germans uh, slightly forestalled this by withdrawing to the Hindenburg line. They, their defences on the Somme were parlous, and so they'd constructed strong defensive positions to which they could fall back. Uh, and they did so, and it, and it threw a bit of a spanner in the works of, of the plans that we'd drawn up, but they were modified to, to cope with this. Uh, the French were to launch a, a huge offensive um, on the River Rhine. It ended up being a disaster, unfortunately, and broke the, the fighting spirit of the French army. Um, but the British were to take part in, in a diversionary attack um, at Arras. Uh, they had new tactics for this. They developed uh, new formations, uh, and the men spent, uh, spent a couple of weeks um, practicing these and, and training for the attack. Um, they, the East Surreys were attached to the Canadian Corps, uh, and the Canadians' job was to secure the heights of Vimy Ridge. Um, the, Canadian, uh, the East Surrey officers uh, went over to the Army HQ and they'd, they'd mocked up a, a 1 to 10,000 scale model of Vimy Ridge um, so that men could inspect where it was they were going and they would make no mistake about uh, the landmarks that they would be seeing as, as they advanced into battle that day. Um, a week of uh, artillery preparation preceded the Battle of Arras, uh, the beginning of April. Um, it shattered the German defences on Vimy Ridge and the four um, Canadian Army Corps advancing side by side for the first time, uh, four divisions advancing, advancing side by side for the first time, were able to take most of their objectives on the first day and complete the capture of their objectives on the second day of that battle. Um, to their south, we've commemorated men who fought um, along the River Scarp, another, another success that day, and it was only on the far right of the battlefield that the attack failed. After the, the highs of those first two days of successes came the lows of a, a drawn-out, attritional battle to just gain small yardage um, all the time. But we kept, we kept plugging away. Uh, there were no great strategic objectives after that first day, but we needed to aid the French who were uh, suffering very badly um, in, their, in their attempts. And so the more German reserves we could draw up to fight us, the better uh, for our allies. 
And so that offensive, after it had stalled, it restarted, stalled, restarted again, and we kept, kept going throughout the whole of, of April and May. And these Surreys had been in support to the Canadians. They hadn't gone into action um, on, in that first battle. And they were in support again later on uh, when their comrades in the 95th Brigade uh, went into action to try and make small gains um, in the north of the battlefield a, a week later. Their time was coming. They had been earmarked uh, for an assault on uh, a wood just outside um, Oppie. Uh, as circumstances uh, uh, played out, it, it would be that they never actually got to take part uh, in that attack. But they were lucky up until that point. At the end of April, the Canadians um, captured the village of Fresnoy. And then the attacks on either side of them had broken down. And so they ended up as this salient, this sort of triangle sticking into the, the German lines. And they were at the tip of this, uh, at, the t at the tip of this triangle. Um, and these Surreys moved in uh, to trenches there in early May. It was a very hazardous spot. The Germans were on either side of their position. They had the high ground up on their left, so they could see down into the East Surrey's position. They had artillery behind that ridge that could fire down. And on the front of that ridge, they had machine guns that could fire along uh, the Surrey's trenches. The East Surrey line was, was not continuous. It was a series of small uh, trenches some of which were old German trenches that had been captured and others which had been just scraped in the ground, dug by the Canadians when, they, when they'd got there. And so the East Surrey had to concentrate on joining those up to make a continuous line of trenches. Now, they were so busy digging, they didn't have time to wire the front of those trenches. They also didn't have time to, to dig support lines or, or reserve lines behind them. So a very, very precarious position they found themselves in, just one line of trench about three quarters of a mile um, held by less than 900 men, so one man for every two yards or so. The Germans um, attacked that, that vulnerable point, that position, um, at about 3 a.m. on the 8th of May. Um, they put down a, a barrage uh, from their artillery and then their rifle grenadiers, these men that fired grenades out of their rifles, almost like mortars, um, put a bombardment onto the East Surrey trenches and the infantry then, then followed that up. It was still dark, but the light, was, uh, the light was growing. And so the East Surrey men, they had targets to shoot at. They had rifles and they had Lewis guns, sort of light machine guns. Uh, and they used them to, to very good effect. It was very muddy, though, and the mud started to clog up their rifles and machine guns. They'd stopped the German advance. But when their volume of fire fell, the Germans took their opportunity and they rushed at the East Surrey trench. The East Surreys were ready for them, though, and they had their grenades, new model bombs, Mills bombs, uh, the classic ones with the pin that you, that you pull out that you think of when you think of a grenade. Before that, they'd, been, they'd had fuses which they had to light, which were very unreliable, particularly in a, in a damp environment that these Surreys had found themselves in. So they threw a hail of these bombs at the Germans, and they stopped the Germans about 20 yards um, from their trenches. But they were not to be deterred, and it wasn't long before they'd try again, because they had just gained a foothold in trenches on the left of these Surreys that were held by the 12th Gloucesters just enough of a gap that they could exploit. And so they attacked again, and they forced masses of men through on the East Surrey's left. Now, most of these Surreys were completely unaware that this was happening. But the, the number two company, the company on the left, um, were fighting very desperately. They were fighting hand to hand uh, to stop these Germans. They were being attacked from the front, from the left, and from the rear. It wasn't long before the Germans were well to the, the back, and they were in amongst the East Surrey's uh, support company in Fresnoy Wood as well. So there was no reinforcement available for the men in the front line. Those other men in the front line uh, were subjected to another attack all along the way of the front, and they held them off. Where their number two company were engaged in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, the Germans were able to get up almost to the front line of the next company along. But the men alongside them were able to shoot across the battlefield and stop that particular attack. It wasn't long before German machine gunners were in behind uh, them, and they had to do some pretty stiff fighting to drive them back. They realized that their left flank was vulnerable, and they needed to, to, to throw their left back so the men would sort of wheel around to the left uh, and then create a, a very narrow uh, salient. And in order to do that, they needed, they needed to buy time. So the, the number one company launched a desperate counterattack on Fresnoy Wood, from which not a single man uh, returned. But it was just enough to, uh, to buy enough time to secure an old German communications trench that could be improvised as a, as a defensive flank. But they couldn't hold out for long. The Germans on the left could shoot all the way across this new uh, salient. Um, orders came from the company that was now in the center 
uh, to retire. They couldn't retire because as soon as they tried to do so, they were shot down by Germans um, on their left. Uh, the company that was on the left flank uh, probably had the easiest of escapes and they still suffered very badly as they did so. The ground had been very churned up by shell fire. It was very wet. You couldn't really run through it. It was open ground. It was full daylight by now and the men were very easy targets indeed. Uh, the East Surreys, as they withdrew, suffered, uh, suffered very, very badly indeed and just handfuls of men uh, from each of the companies um, returned. Um, of one of the platoons, the one on the left, only uh, out of three of their four platoons, not a single man was unwounded. Um, they were practically wiped out uh, that day. And Lawrence uh, was among the, the 300 or so men that were missing uh, that day. It was months later um, before an official casualty report was published um, listing him as missing. There were that many casualties at the Battle of Arras and then, of course, later at Passchendaele. And it was sometime after that that he was confirmed as having been killed uh, that day. He was 28 years old. We're now going to toll the bell for Lawrence.